My name is Blake, and I'm one of the pastors here. I just want to say I'm so glad to be here while Pastor Kelly is out on vacation with his beautiful bride. And man, what an honor to serve and love alongside of that guy and to see all that uh, God's doing here at River Point is like such a blessing to be a small part of. And this week I, I'm fired up because I get to go and love on all of the students uh, during the student ministry week at camp at Beach Week. And so I'm fired up to do that. Um, it's going to be suffering for the Lord in Destin, Florida. <laughs> so it's going to be hard. You guys need to pray for me. Uh, my, my whole family's going with me, and so we get to hang out with Lisa and my wife and my kids. I'll be a part of it, so I'm super fired up to be a, a part of that. So I'd like to welcome everybody online. Thank you so much for joining us, and I'd also like to welcome the Missouri City Campus. Thank you for being a part of uh, all that's happening there in Missouri City. I encourage you to go and love on Scott. That dude's amazing. He's a great pastor, so uh, take care of him, okay? All right, so today it's an exciting day. We're starting a new series, and it's called Unstuck. And uh, there's lots of places in our life where we find ourselves just like stuck in, in all kinds of different areas. And so our prayer in this series is that we'd find some real and practical ways to take some steps towards freedom. There's lots of, of areas that we get stuck, like in our marriage and relationships, we'll find ourselves stuck. And so here's what's kind of cool about this series is that we're going to provide resources um, each week uh, to be able to help you with what we're talking about that weekend. So um, like the weekend that we talk about marriages and how we sometimes just uh, don't know how to move forward and you find yourself going, man, I, I, I don't know if I even like you anymore. Like how do you restore that? And so we're going to have some, some counseling and some resources for you that weekend. And then the, there's one weekend we're going to talk about finances and how we, uh, m maybe you're looking at a pile of debt and like, I don't have any idea how, how to get out of this uh, mess that I've made of my finances. And so we're going to help you get unstuck by, by providing some steps towards financial freedom. And so we also, uh, this weekend, are going to be talking about addiction. And uh, not just addiction, but like maybe bad habits. And so like when you're sad and you're depressed or stressed, like what do you think about and what kind of has your affection and your attention when maybe it shouldn't? So maybe for you, it's like, dude, I'm stressed on my mind. I'm going shopping and I'm going to spend a bunch of money at the mall. Or maybe for you, it's like excessive eating. And so you have these habits that maybe are unhealthy. And so we want to help you get unstuck. And so uh, even tomorrow night, there's a man by the name of John, I forgot his last name, Rob, Robes, Robeson is his name, John Robeson. And that dude's amazing. He has a heart for counseling and helping people be set free from any sort of bad habits and addictions. And so tomorrow night, 7 o'clock here at the church, uh, there's some more information in, in your program to be able to take some steps towards freedom if that's something that you're struggling with. So we want to make that available for you tomorrow. I encourage you to be a part of that, okay? So today, brand new series, Unstuck. There's all kinds of things that I've been stuck in, things like um, I've, been, I've been stuck in an elevator, I've been st stuck in traffic, I've been stuck on the phone, I've been stuck in a tree, I've, I've sunk my deep in mud and been stuck, I've, I've been stuck in, in uh, an airport, so I, I want you to, I've been stuck in a bad conversation, even in the lobby, <laughs> but it wasn't you, so don't, um, I want you to finish this sentence, um, Sometimes I'm stuck between a rock and a, yeah, so that's sort of what I'm talking about today, is I'm going to talk about the life of David, and how this young man was stuck between a rock and a hard place, and how his life uh, is, is very similar to ours in a lot of areas, and we might not even be aware of it. So I'm going to talk about 1 Samuel chapter 24, if you want to open your Bibles to that. I'm going to weave in and out of that story, and I'm going to kind of connect it to our lives, okay? So, um, but before I do that, I want to tell you a few stories of uh, some times that my kids got stuck under my care. And so I, I remember being at a restaurant with my daughter when she was just two years old, Madison, my firstborn, and, and my wife and I were uh, out to eat, and so, so my daughter decides she she wants to know what it's like to stick her head between two of the spindles while we're standing in line. And I have no idea how she did it because I was like, you know, grabbing her, trying to get her out and her little head. And she's like, Daddy, I'm scared. And I was like, me too, honey. Um, and my wife is screaming. The management's coming over. And they're all like, uh, how did she do this? I, I don't know. I'm trying to like tear this metal. It's too hard. It was awesome. And so... Um, She's in counseling now. She's going to be fine. But 
Uh, another thing that happened was my daughter Montana, um, we were in the backyard and she had friends over and, and she decides to see how far she can stick a beat up her nose. And so I'm like, oh, why have you done this? Your mama's not here. I have no idea what I'm doing. So I did what every man would do. I got my shop back out <laughs> and I tried, but it didn't work. And so I was like, what do I do? So I grabbed one of those, you know, the ball thing that has the sucker. And it's, it's booger sucker is what it's called. And uh, I tried that, but it just pushed it more in there. I'm like, wow, do I, I have no idea. So I had a moment of genius. And I decided I'm going to grab her face. And I'm going to put my mouth over her nose, and I'm going to suck it out. <laughs> and so I, I hadn't really thought through the whole thing. <laughs> and I put my mouth over her face, and it turns out she had a sinus infection at the time. <laughs> and uh, my mouth was filled with snot and stuff. And <laughs> it was awful. But you guys are all judging me right now, but... But let me just tell you, it worked. And I'm telling you, it was a stroke of genius. So she's just fine, too. She's in counseling also. Um, <laughs> so today, there's all kinds of things in our lives where we do find ourselves like, how did I get here? Like, I'm stuck. So I have good news for you today. Uh, there is hope for your stuck. So I want you to turn to the person beside you and say, there is hope for your stuck. Come on, come on, say it loud. <laughs> so um, sometimes we find ourselves going, man, God, was this really your plan for me? Is this what you had, you drew this up? Because I don't know how I got here. I'm really ashamed maybe of some of the things that I've got myself into. And I've made a mess of my life. And I, I don't know how, how to figure this out. See, the, the lie is this. The lie is, man, if you knew what was really going on in, inside of me, in my head, and the way I think, and the things that I... I really think about and how dirty I really am. If you knew, if you knew that, did you would realize I am a mess, and you you wouldn't want to be around me. But the truth, the truth is, see, that's the lie we tell ourselves, man. If they really knew, but the truth is, the more that I'm invited into your mess, and the more that I understand you, and and normally the brokenness that you have, the more I feel connected to you. If you tell me where you're hurting and where, where your pain is, then I relate to you more. I understand your brokenness because of how broken I am. But for whatever reason, we still want to conceal. We want to hide. We don't want to cover it up. I don't want you to know my problems and my stuff, right? But And so we find ourselves just going, man, <clears throat> I'm going to put this mask on. I'm going to make small talk because we don't really want people to, uh, to see or to feel the wounds that each of us are carrying. See, we're, we're more interested a lot of the times in self-preservation and reputation management than being made whole from what we're hiding. We need to stop that nonsense. The, the Bible says that everyone has sinned and that all fall short of the glory of God. So you're off the hook. Like, it's okay. That What that verse means is that everybody's jacked up. And so you can turn to the person beside you and you can just say this. Say, I heard the truth about you. You've got issues. <laughs> Go ahead. That's okay. You can say that. <laughs> Some of you are like, yeah, what's up? You've got issues. <laughs> the last service, um, I saw this one couple say that to each other. And then they're like, I'm just kidding. They kissed. <laughs> um, I I would like to just tell you that, man, there's only one person that's perfect in all of history, and it's not you. And so we need to stop acting like we have our stuff together. I'd like to tell you this beautiful account of a young man by the name of David who made a, a bunch of bad decisions in his life. But at the same time, he was also called a man after God's own heart. And so it, it's kind of a contradiction, but really all of us are a contradiction. All of us have sin in our life, but we also love God. Right? Every one of us. So let's just be done with the whole hypocrite thing. You're all a hypocrite. All right? We all, we all want to love God with all of our heart, but we have this sinful nature that causes us to sin. You know what sinners do? They sin. And so I just want to just tell you this story about David and how as a young man, he had this enormous faith and he loved God with this purity. And he found himself as a shepherd in, in a field protecting these sheep. And on two different occasions, a lion came into his pen and a bear came into his pen. And he killed them with his bare hands. 
because of faith in God, God protected him. And then one day, he goes to deliver some, some food to his brothers because they're out on the field bat- battling and fighting the Philistines. And as he gets there, there's this nine-foot-tall man, a huge man. Like, he's so tall that when he puts his hand up, it's above the glass at the basketball goal, okay? He's huge. <clears throat> and so, uh, as he's walking up, he hears this man taunting his brothers, the Israelites, the army. And, and then he taunts the living God. And David's like, he's, he's 13. He's like, what did he say? <laughs> he walks up to King Saul. He's like, excuse me, sir, I want to kill Goliath. <laughs> and Goliath, it's Saul's like, uh, you're a little boy that's not, no. And his brothers are yelling at him. They're all mocking him. And they put armor on him, and it's too heavy. And he's like, I can't wear this. It's too heavy. I can't carry your sword. And so he, he just like, um, you know what, I'm good. I brought some rocks with me. And uh, he takes off into the field. Hits him in the forehead. This big man drops to the ground. He takes the man's sword. He could barely pick up and cuts his head off, holds his head up before the Israelite army. He's like, hey, guys, he's dead. <laughs> right? <laughs> this little boy runs out to the field. The Philistines then retreat. The Israelites win the battle. And now, all of a sudden, this kid is like brought to national celebrity. All of a sudden, he's like famous in all of the land. And King Saul's like, you know what? I'm going to put you as the head of the army. He's invited into King Saul's family. And now his son, Jonathan, Saul's son, becomes David's best friend. And so now it's, it's, they almost have like this father-son relationship. And David all of a sudden now has this enormous amount of respect and love and fame from the entire nation. And so out of nowhere, uh, Saul's kind of like going, wow, I, I, I didn't know this boy could kind of come in and sort of have so much national affection, and he starts to turn. Something inside of Saul starts to change. And what was once love turned to jealousy. See, Saul loved power, and he loved authority. And now this little punk is coming into my kingdom, and people are saying things like, man, Saul, he kills a 1,000 people, but David kills 10,000. And there's these songs written about it. And, and Saul starts to get enormously, insanely jealous He's like, I'm not going to let this happen so much so that Saul decides, that's it. I'm killing David. I'm done with him. And he runs him out of town, and he chases him with an army, and David finds himself fleeing for his life. And he, he can't go anywhere and hide, so he's like, you know, where does he go? Behind trees, he goes to people's house. And so you know what he does? He finds himself in, in the bowels of a cave. He's hiding in this cave. And I want to read this passage to you out of 1 Samuel 24. It says, When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. And then Saul took 3,000 men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rocks. And he came to the sheepfolds, by the way, where there was a cave. And Saul, he went in to relieve himself. This is in the Bible. This is such a great story. So he goes in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. And the men of David said to him, Here's the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give you your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. And then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. That is cool. Dude, did you know that's in the Bible? I've been in a cave, and, and it, it's quiet, real quiet. You can hear everything, even a little drip. You can bats breathing. And he, like, stealthily, I love that word, like, sneaks up, backs out. Cool. So here he is, and he's actually, like, not in a good place. I need you to think about this. David, man, he was stuck. He didn't have anywhere he could go that it was safe. And he's trapped. He's scared. It's dark. And he wasn't thinking, man, I love this cave. I'm going to hang up a little plaque that says home sweet home. Make myself a little, you know, pallet. I'm going to sleep here the rest of my life. This is great. 
He's not thinking that. He's like, I want out of this circumstance. What can I do to get out of this circumstance that I'm in? He was feeling betrayal. He was broken. He was defeated. And he, he had been prophesied that he was going to be the next successor to the king. And so here he is, the crown prince of Israel, is living in a damp and dark cave. He's dirty, he's filthy, he wants to shower. And here's David, he's going, man, I'm at the lowest point of my life. He's trying to figure out, how did I get here? What happened? Just the other day, I was sitting at the king's courts, and I was at a great bed, and, and things were good, like Jonathan and I were hanging out, we were chasing bunnies with our bow and arrow, like everything was good. And now, how did I get here? Why does, why does Saul want to kill me? And why is he chasing after me like a dog? Where, where could I go that I'm safe? God, 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 I feel so fragile. I feel so vulnerable. And, and he's saying to God, well, how, how did you have this for my story? How, how is this really where you thought my, my life should go? And he's probably feeling like I'm praying and you're not hearing me. And he feels like God has abandoned him. Can I just preach for a second? Sometimes when God is wanting to place a comma, we choose to think that he's putting a period. So, sometimes when God is placing a comma, we choose to think that he's putting a period. You, you might think that that's where you're at right now and there's no hope for you. And, and you're like at the end of your rope and maybe he left you for another woman. And maybe you got the diagnosis and it's your worst nightmare. Maybe you just lost somebody and that was close to you and they're gone and you're like trying to pick up the pieces. Maybe you just lost your job and you're like, I don't have any idea how I'm going to make ends meet. And maybe for all of us have been in a season in our life when we're sitting in the back of that cave and we're sulking. And we're crying, and we're praying, and we're done. We're sick and tired of trying to figure it out, and we can't seem to make anything work. And maybe even you're at the very worst part of your life just going, considering the, the very worst things. And, and you're just like, God, where are you? But see, you placed a period when you were supposed to be placing a comma. Because if God is for us, then who can stand against us? He's got you in that cave for a reason. He knows what he's doing with your life. And he, he might be just softening you, your heart and preparing you to establish you as a king. God's not done with you, even though you might be done with you. He's ready to face the battles that you don't want to face. So you need to stop placing a period. It's just a one part of your story. God has a plan. He has a way. He will prevail. He will have victory. And in an instant, our God can change everything. So out of nowhere, the unthinkable happens. And here he comes. The, the king walks in and he's going potty. <laughs> the man that he looked up to, like this is the king. It's Jonathan's dad. And there he is. It's just him and two of them. The, the man who had defamed him had destroyed his reputation. He had thrown spears at him. And now he's chasing him like a dog to kill him, hunting him down. What, what would you do? Right? This isn't like he's not in front of a bunch of lawyers in the court of law. This is his enemy. And he's in a back alley. And you know what his boys are saying in the cave? Like, oh, now. Let's roll him up and beat him down like a sucker, right? We're going to show him what's up right now, what he did to you, right? And he's like, no, 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 no. He sneaks up, cuts a piece of his robe off, takes it back, and he's holding on to it. And there he is going, man. See, I think, I think, I think David realized the magnitude of that moment. He realized that. I have a choice right now, and it could be one of the largest choices of my life. He knew that that decision 
could change the trajectory of his life. I like to say that he was sitting on if. If he chose to like go up to him and talk to him, it could have ended in a brawl, a fight, and not been good. If he had chose to kill him, what does that do? It had been satisfaction. It had been a quick little cheap thrill, right? Like, yeah, finally vindicated, right? If he took vengeance for himself. But what would that really do? Who wants to vote for this king who's just killed the other king, right? It, it could have messed up his entire legacy. It could have destroyed him. And so there he is with this massive decision that he was going, I, I don't know what to do. We've all been there. It's so easy to sin. It's so quick, too, and it happens so fast. And we'll find ourselves like just being brought in, and it's alluring. And you go, man, I, in a minute, everything, everything can be gone. I can make the wrong decision so easily. And, and in one moment and one bad decision, our lives can be changed forever. And we can be stuck with that decision. See, I think that really becoming unstuck is about making right decisions. Making a decision that will lead us towards health instead of destruction. So we, we, can, we can just justify it really easily by saying, man, it's just a small decision. It's no big deal. I just wanted to spend a little extra money because I was feeling stressed. And so now you're like, how did I get in this pile of debt? Or I just wanted to look at a little bit of porn. It's not hurting anyone else. But then it led to a full-blown affair. Or maybe it was like I just thought I was in pain. It just cut the edge, so I took some pre prescription pills. But now you find yourself in, in detox. Like, how, how did I get here? Or, or maybe it's like the bad habits we talked about where you're like, man, I, I just, I'm addicted to my work. And I, I will just, when I'm a little stressed, I just stay there forever. And I don't ever stop. Or maybe for you, it's like you just overeat or shopping, like I said. And so for, for each of us, we have this the desire to battle our flesh and our spirit every day. We either will choose to walk in the gratification of our flesh and have the instant satisfaction, or we choose to go, you know what, I'm going to choose to make the decision to walk in the power of the spirit and not allow my flesh to get what it wants. And so that's where David's face is like, I, I have this temptation. And, and that temptation is just like the same in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve are faced with this apple, like, you'll know more, bro. Like, if you take this, it's going to feel good. You, you don't know as much as you. You're missing out. YOLO. Right? <laughs> well, you need to try this out, man. It's going to feel, and it's just alluring. It just draws you in, and you always want more. You're never satisfied. That's, that's what temptation does. It's what, that's exactly what Tanya talked about last week, is that we have this desire to want more, and temptations, man, they're a lie. And you can't trust your desires because they'll lead you down a p place where you'll have the biggest regret, the biggest decision of your life, and, and that's exactly where, where David's at. He could have fulfilled the temporary craving to, to throw away his reputation. He could have had the cheap throw, but, man, I, I've seen this so many times. A leader that's trusted, a parent, a coach, the president of the United States, make a decision that destroys his legacy. In a moment of weakness, they make the worst decision of their lives, and they're found themselves stuck with their own undoing. Well, David, man, he chose to spare Saul's life. And that, that scene, it's so powerful in the Bible. I don't know if you even knew that was in the Bible. Here, here he is, faced with this decision to kill the king. It's like, it's like a scene out of like Braveheart or Gladiator, right? He just goes Jason Bourne on him. And he sneaks up and, and he cuts a piece of his robe and he's holding it. And then in the next part of this passage, it says, Afterward, David also arose and went out of the cave. After Saul left the cave, he goes out of the cave as well. And he yells out, My lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with, with his face low to the earth. He paid homage and he said, David said to Saul, 
Why, why do you listen to the words of men who say, Behold, David seeks your harm. Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in this cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, he calls Saul his father. My father, see the corner of your robe? Look at it. It's in my hand. By the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and I did not kill you, you may know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you, though you hump my life to take it. May the Lord judge between me and you, and may the Lord avenge me against you, but my hand shall not be against you. I think it's such a great example for us to go... Why, why would I choose in a moment of weakness to lose everything that I am and everything that I have? Because when we choose to go, God, I trust you and I want you to avenge me. I'm not going to try to make my name great. I want to make your name great. Then, then it changes everything. See, I, I have something to say to you this morning. We can't control what happens to us, but if we believe that God is for us, then we must trust that God will move through us. I I want everyone in this church and online to say that out loud right now if you believe it. Say, we can't control what happens to us, but if we believe that our God is for us, then we must trust that God will move through us. Amen? Now, I'm aware when I say you can't control what happens to you, that some of you have had horrific things happen to you, things that were out of your control and it should have never, ever happened. Maybe you were broken into and somebody stole your stuff or did something awful to you, and now there's this fear and this hatred and you have alarm systems, and you can't walk in the dark, and it's real, and you're in the middle of it because something happened to you that was evil, or maybe worse, as a child, something happened that was sexual, and it was awful, and it was the enemy of darkness that destroyed you. Can I just say, that is not God's will for your life, and it's not what he wanted for you, and so here's David that's being chased by evil. And he finds himself in a cave crying out to God going, why? Why? I didn't want this for my life. I, nobody wants to be around me. Everybody hates me. My enemies are everywhere. I'm scared for my life. God, why am, am I here? God wants the very best for his children. He wants to bless us. But somehow we easily mistake him growing us and disciplining us for his forsaking us and leaving us. Somehow we quickly go from, God, I, I don't, this evil happened to me, but I, and I'm mad at you, but I want to try to grow with you. I want to become intimate with you, but I can't seem to pray right now. And you're in the middle of that whole thing, and, but maybe God is in that cave with you after the, hap, the thing happens, and he's softening your heart. And he's loving you and he's repairing the wounds. And he's reminding you of how much he's intimate with you in the middle of that cave. And even though it's dark and you feel alone, God has not forsaken you. And he has not left you. This series, um, it was birthed out of a place where a group of small men in a small group here got together. And it was sort of like stuck in neutral. Nothing was really happening in a small group. There wasn't real honesty. They were sort of playing games and making small talk most weeks, and it sort of wasn't really moving forward. Until one day, one guy got brutally honest, and he was vulnerable enough to go, I, I have something to tell you guys. Just, just like Casey did in the video earlier, and just really was repentant about where he was at, he, he said to the guys, listen, I, I'm a horrible husband. And my wife wants to leave me, and we're talking about divorce. 
and I don't know what to do. And because of that vulnerability, those men gathered around him and they started working on it together, started praying. And then shortly after that, another guy goes, you know what, man? I need to be honest with you guys. I'm struggling with a porn addiction. And I, I don't know how to get out of it. And I need your help. I need your prayers. Because I find myself just going, why am I doing this? I hate myself for it. And then another guy says, you know what, man? I, I actually am a wreck at my home. And I don't know how to manage money at all. And my finances are shot. And we're facing bankruptcy and I could lose everything. And one guy said, you know what, man, I actually struggle with faith in God. I'm really, really battling to believe. I've been in church, but I'm struggling to believe. And so it was just one guy after another just kind of being really honest and raw. And they started to encourage each other. They started to pray for each other. And something beautiful started to happen. There was real community. And they knew that, man, God is for us. And they started to seek him and start to pray over those things and pray for each other. And there is starting to be some healing. Are they perfect now? No. Is it like hunky-dory? No. But, man, they now are like poised to please God more than ever. And they're poised to help each other. And they're bringing healing to one another. That is what the church is for. We're supposed to be a place where I can go, dude, I'm messed up. And everyone says, yeah, me too. And, and you help one another and serve each other. And so that's exactly where David was. David just needed Saul to hear his heart. Like, bro, I got to be honest with you. You got to hear me. And he was trying to figure out how to do that. And so he, he, he goes before David or Saul and he's, he's like crying. He's weeping, falls on his knees in, in repentance, prostrate, in complete humility, and he bows before him, and, and here's what happens. As soon as David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, Is this your voice, my son David? He calls him son. And Saul lifted up his voice, and he wept. Saul, King Saul, was weeping. He, he said to David, You are more righteous than I. For you have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you with evil. And you have declared this day how you have dealt well with me, in that you did not kill me when the Lord put me into your hands. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safe? So, so may the Lord reward you, David, and may he reward you the good for what you've done to me on this day. And so God established David because of his decision to want to please God than to fulfill his own satisfaction and desires. Because God, because David saw God and said, I want to please you, God found him faithful and, and blessed him. Listen, you might, you might think there's no hope for you. But today, can I just speak that there is hope for your stuck? And you might think your story is awful, but you need to stop putting the period where God's putting a comma, because he's not done, and he does have a plan, and he's sovereign, and he's in control, and sometimes I want to take the pen from him and write my own story, because I think he's writing a bad one, but he hasn't messed up. And you might be in a cave this morning, but he has you there for a reason. So seek God and serve the people around you. And that's how we get unstuck. by Placing our faith in a God who's got a lot more power than you do. And then trusting the people around you to help you through the season that you're in. Will you pray with me? Father, your scriptures say it's for freedom that we were set free. So thank you for giving us freedom from our bondage. Thank you for letting us know that even though we mess up all the time, that you still love us and you still care for us and you want us to know that you still have a plan for us. So Father, we just pray right now that if there's anyone in this room or online or at the Missouri City campus that's struggling with bondage and they are in chains, I pray, Lord, you would set them free. If it's something that's real, like an addiction, God, I pray that that would be broke free. Maybe it's greed. Maybe it's that they lie. Maybe, Father, that 
somebody here is struggling with the fact that they overeat and they are obsessed with buying too much, I pray, Father, we would run to you and that you would fulfill our desires and we wouldn't try to self-medicate with the things that are in this world that are cheap and shiny and they mean nothing. I pray, Father, Lord, that we would long for you more, that we would place our desire and our affection and our passion towards you, O God. And I pray, Father, that you would avenge us, that you would fight for us, that you would help us be delivered from our enemies, even if that enemy is ourself. So, Father, I pray for freedom in this place. I pray that we would be set free to do your work and be a part of your kingdom and to fight for the truth because your truth, God, sets us free. So, Father, I pray that we would seek that. We'd seek to please you with all of our heart, with all of our mind, and with all of our soul. Oh, God, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I'd like to ask if there's anybody here that would like prayer, and maybe you want to find some healing today. There is a prayer team up here that would...